Okay, yes, um, we have a, a permanently temporally aware model for artistic recommendation. Uh, this is mainly the work of my student, Ruining here, who couldn't make it to the conference today, and also our collaborators from Adobe, Chen Fang and Zhao Wang. Okay, so <clears throat> what we'd like to do is try and build recommender systems that can estimate people's artistic preferences on the web. So there's been a lot of interest lately in, in building these models that are somehow visually aware, that learn to recommend things in terms of their visual appearance. Um, when I say there's been a lot of interest, I mean I'm interested in it. Uh, we've been developing these models that do things like um, clothing recommendation using Amazon product images and things like that, where you have these data sets that are very, very sparse, very, very long-tailed, so you'd like to use the content and in particular the visual appearance of objects in order to estimate people's preferences toward them. Um, however, if you're thinking of something like an artistic website, uh, we're looking at Behance.com here, there are going to be other features besides the visual appearance of an object that might be important for recommendation. So it could be um, social relationships that artists have to each other. People might tend to like each other's work um, in a way that goes beyond just the visual appearance of it. And there could also be temporal um, features as well. There might be trends that change in terms of what art people like over time. And there might also be uh, things like consistency effects. You might want to recommend art that is visually consistent with something people have viewed previously. Uh, so the basic research question in this talk is, is how can we combine uh, ideas that we've already been developing for sort of visually aware recommendation and also make them aware of social signals and um, temporal patterns? Okay, so there are three kind of ingredients we'd like to have in our model. One is this idea of can we build a recommender system that is aware of the visual appearance of objects? Um, another is can we build uh, a model of temporal dynamics? And in this case, temporal dynamics is really going to mean things like sequential dynamics. If you're browsing art, if you're clicking on things, uh, you might want to be given recommendations that are somehow consistent with the actions you've been performing previously. And we'd also like things like social dynamics. And in this particular context, social dynamics is not necessarily going to mean friendship connections in a social network or something like that, but rather relationships that the creators of art have to the uh, consumers of the art. So the people clicking on things have to the people who actually uploaded the content. So essentially we have these three parts. We have a model of uh, the content that we're recommending. We have a model of sequential actions. And we have a model of consumer creator preferences. So these are two ideas that uh, we and others have been looking at. And this is maybe something that's uh, more unique to this particular data set we're studying, where the people who are evaluating things are also the people who create the content. All right, so this is the data set we're looking at. It's Behance.com. It's uh, an Adobe website, which is where we got the data from. Uh, it's a sort of social art community where people can upload these galleries of artworks. Each of these, uh, if you click on it, is going to be a gallery containing several images, and they can uh, like and or appreciate each other's work. So we're looking at these things called uh, appreciates in this data set, where a user can explicitly express a positive preference. There's no negative preferences on this website towards somebody else's um, art. And we're also looking at views or click data. So we have these two types of kind of one class feedback that we'd like to model uh, in terms of whether people have explicitly appreciated something or whether they've clicked on something. Um, so a few statistics about this data set. Uh, this is, I think, uh, one month of interactions by active users. So we have about 400,000 users on the order of a million images. Um, and then we have 11 million appreciates and almost 50 million clicks. So we're going to look at models of both click and appreciate data. The two are, are fairly similar to each other, except that one is explicit and one is implicit. Uh, the click data, unfortunately, is proprietary, so we can't release any of it. But the appreciate data, since that's sort of publicly visible, um, Adobe's given us permission to put all of that online for reproducibility and comparison. It, it should be on Ruining's website. If it's not, then email him and CC me, and we'll make it happen, OK? All right, so we'd like to build a model that's capable of predicting uh, these types of implicit feedback in the form of clicks and appreciates. So the basic thing we'd like to do, like with a lot of recommender systems, is estimate this function that's going to uh, predict this binary signal or perhaps probability that says, would a user you click on an item or an image I, or would they appreciate that item? So 
We're going to start with this very familiar sort of latent factor model in the BPR framework, since we only have uh, positive feedback, where what we're going to try and do is take uh, a user, uh, an item they clicked on, and a, a randomly sampled item they did not click on, and what we'd like to optimize is the, the separation in compatibility between the thing they did click on and the thing they didn't click on. So we'd like the clicked on item to be estimated as being more compatible than the non-clicked on item. And this is kind of the, the very, very basic vanilla BPR framework, but all we're gonna do is try and extend this model to incorporate all of those visual and temporal and social components. And that's about all I'm gonna say about optimization. Um, you can imagine that everything we're doing is differentiable and we can perform stochastic gradient ascent and all that kind of thing. All we're really gonna do from now on is take this very basic model that only has bias terms and user item interaction and we're gonna add social, temporal, visual features to that. Okay, so we start with this very, very basic model which just measures latent uh, user preferences and latent item properties, the very sort of standard latent factor model. Uh, just to remind you of notation, we have uh, the probability that a user would click on an item is proportional to the inner product of the, the latent user preferences and the latent item properties. Okay, nothing too, nothing too exotic there. So what's next? Uh, that's kind of user and item relationships handled in a very standard way. The next thing you might want to model is item to item relationships. And in particular, this idea that if a user is interacting with two items in sequence, those items should somehow be compatible with each other in terms of maybe their visual or in terms of their latent attributes. So this we can build on top of a very, you know, this is a standard idea that we can build on a standard model called factorized personalized Markov chains. Um, you know, you notice if you actually look at some of these data sets, if you look at uh, a particular session by, by one user, this is the sequence of items a user clicked on, uh, the next thing they click on is likely to be somehow uh, visually consistent with that. I'm not sure what this style is called. I think this is goth images or something like that, maybe. Um, and this is anime or something like that. Um, but you can sort of convince yourself that people tend to focus on a particular style of object for a particular period of time. And then if you looked at their next session, they might be browsing something totally different. So uh, we kind of captured this with a simple model that now has memory. So we're now looking at the probability that a user clicks on an item at a particular point in time, which is conditioned on the previous action they performed. And we still have this user to item compatibility, but we now add this additional latent factor, which captures item to item compatibility. So the, a new latent vector psi for the item should be similar to the latent vector for the previous item, and that's multiplied by a per user term that says how much does this user care about consistency between items. Okay, so we had um, user to item compatibility and then we had item to item compatibility. The third thing we might want is, is user to user compatibility. Uh, and in the case of an art website, that's gonna mean the tendency of a particular user to appreciate content made by a certain individual. So what we're gonna to add to this model is a term which is the owner of an item I, who's also a user of the system, and an additional set of latent factors. You can never have too many latent factors at a recommended system conference. So one of which describes the user and one of which describes the owner of the item um, that they're evaluating. So in some additional latent space, the user should be compatible with the owner of the art. So you can see how this would be useful in certain maybe cold start scenarios. If a, if a new image is uploaded, um, and we don't know anything about it. Well, we still know something about the, the user who uploaded it. Uh, and that gives us a pretty good model of what kind of user is gonna like it. Uh, in other cold start settings, you know, even if some user has never evaluated art before, if they've uploaded art before, this actually gives us a model of the kind of thing they're likely to enjoy and sort of vice versa. If a user has evaluated other people's art but never uploaded something, then as soon as they upload something, this gives us a good sense of what kind of other users will enjoy it. Okay, so that's now user-user compatibility. And we can do the same sort of trick by adding memory to this. Um, the item should be compatible with the previous item and maybe the owner should also be compatible with the previous owner. Okay, and you know, we can, we can extend this further by adding more memory to this Markov chain. Nothing too complicated here, although I'm adding a lot of notation. All we're saying is that 
rather than looking at the previous action, we can look at the sequence of k previous actions and say the item should be consistent with the previous k items, the owner should be consistent with the previous k owners, and we can learn this kind of user-specific decay function, which says how quickly does a particular user forget about the past, if you like. All right, so the final piece we want in our model, other than this social and temporal factors, is actually some model of the visual content. So this is something we've been working on a lot for you know, clothing recommendations and things like that, where we'd like to build some high dimensional representation of an image and then learn uh, what are the dimension, visual dimensions that explain users' preferences towards things. So we build this on top of a sort of cafe reference model, which is a, um, a sort of CNN that's trained to do classification. We look at the activation weights of the last layer. That gives us a sort of four kilobyte um, feature vector describing the image. And what we'd like to do is say, well, which combinations of these features are actually relevant to users' preferences or not? Um, and we do so in the following way. So rather than just having a latent factor describing each item, we have um, a latent factor plus some combination of visual features. So if this is our, our 4096 dimensional visual feature, this is now a 4096 by k dimensional embedding that says what are the, the sort of combinations of visual features that actually are relevant to users' preferences. And even though it's a lot of parameters, it's this big global function that we can learn for everyone. So what this is gonna do is help us in cold start settings. If we've never seen this item before, we can't possibly estimate its latent factors, but we do know what it looks like. Um, but once we've seen enough interactions with the item, the, the latent factors will eventually be able to take over. So we learn two embeddings, one that measures user to item compatibility and one that measures item to item visual compatibility. Okay, and yeah, like I say, this is all from uh, these models we've been developing called sort of visual Bayesian personalized ranking. Um, there's certainly plenty of tricks that go into that. It it's becomes quite difficult when you're doing things like stochastic gradient ascent when every one of your user item observations is associated with some very, very high dimensional structure, but you know, you can look at our past work to see how we kind of plug this piece of the model in. All right, so some results. Um, there's probably way too many results here, so I'll just sort of point out the bits that are relevant. Um, we have the sort of standard BPR model, which is just user item interactions, no social, no visual terms. The, the visual version of that, um, the factorized personalized Markov chain, and then two versions of our model, one with visual data and one without. So there are only a few parts of this that are maybe really interesting. Um, one is maybe the, the overall improvement of the model, which is about 5% in terms of the AUC, uh, and also sort of these, these cold start results. So um, if it's a cold item, in other words, the image has been newly uploaded, nobody's clicked on it or appreciated it before, you can get fairly huge improvements with this type of model. Uh, funnily enough, um, the improvement between the visual and the non-visual version of the model is, is not that big. So somehow things like this uh, user-aware term that says who created the item is actually doing most of the heavy lifting in terms of getting that good cold start performance. And then, you know, just an ad for the results in our paper, we do a bunch of other types of cold start settings when you have um, the user transitioning between sessions um, or browsing content within the same session or transitioning between artists and so on and so forth. Um, the other fun thing, of course, you can do with these models of uh, visual content is come up with visualizations. So this is like a TS and E embedding where we have said that this is actually a visualization of that um, 4096 by K embedding matrix we learned, then projected down into two dimensions. So it's essentially learning an embedding of images such that users' click sequences should be mapped to nearby points in Euclidean space. So what these lines, which you can hardly see, are showing are just um, a sequence of sessions by one user, and in this embedding, they, they tend to sort of make small jumps. So it's learning this notion of which things go together. Okay, so just to quickly summarize, and I'm almost out of time, um, we've tried to build these models for artistic websites um, based on implicit feedback, like likes and appreciates. The basic idea was to build a model that's aware of these three components, visual features, social features, and sequential dynamics. Um, visual features and sequential dynamics are kind of already well understood, so we wanted to combine those aspects and look at this sort of new take on social attributes where 
the people who create content are actually the same people evaluating things. Um, and yeah, it's especially effective for cold start situations. Um, and you know, like I say, uh, it's, it's mainly the work of my student ruining here. Uh, and hopefully all of our code and data is available online by now. All right, thanks. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Hi, thanks for the talk. Very nice. Um, I, I wonder, um, regarding the, the train model with CAFE, um, I have the impression that this model has been trained with images in general, right? Mm -hmm. And these are artistic um, images. So how, how, the, how artistic they were, I, I, what I'm talking about is that there were abstract uh, works, for instance, because I have the feeling that maybe you couldn't really train those features from the uh, picture images that CAFE was trained on. Um, yeah. What so do you think the impact of that could be? This is, is not, it's not exactly the sort of regular image net CAFE here. So it's, it's the same model that's been trained on this set of images. Ah, so, OK, OK. Yeah. Um, so that was done by our Adobe collaborators. I, don't, I think it was just trained to do classification or something like that. Um, of these images. So it, yeah, the, the images used to train the CNN model should be the same vocabulary of images that we're evaluating the thing on. Okay. So I think the data set you're looking at is quite interesting because it's different from most of the ones we look at. What, what difference do you think it makes that it's much more for pleasure and just browsing and, and looking at, at visualizing uh, the different pieces of art and you're not going to have the same level of popularity that let's say Netflix would have be able to fall back on with little data for the user and their intent is just so different from let's say purchasing or watching a movie. Yeah, I mean I think at the very least those give big differences in terms of things like the sparsity structure of the data set. Uh, there's very few sort of super popular items that everyone's just going to enjoy and can be recommended to everyone. So you need to have a, a great deal of personalization. Um, obviously, people can browse hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things in a session versus watching movies on Netflix where you watch maybe one or two a day. Um, so these ideas like context and a person wanting to stay within visually consistent things become much more important than they would be elsewhere. Um, and also, seemingly, people rely much more on um, who the uploader was as opposed to the visual content itself, which I think is the most unique aspect, perhaps. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.